doubleheader and the third of a four-game set between NC State taking on the sixth-ranked Seminoles at Joanne Graf Field in Florida's capital city. Sean Davison alongside one of the best to step into the circle at South Carolina, an assistant coach at several stops, including right here in Tallahassee, and Dr. Megan Matthews Bunning. And Megan, straight away, NC State came out swinging against the Seminoles. NC State jumped out, like you said, in that first inning, but they were not able to put anything else together. Florida State also matched them toe-to-toe, -to -toe and their offense just exploded. NC State would score one in the top of the first. The Seminoles would play three in the bottom, and it would just start a string of extra base hits. Half of the Seminoles' extra base hits, or excuse me, half of the Seminoles' hits would be for extra bases. This one here from Lizzie Mason would extend the lead for Florida State. And when all was said and done, they would lead by and win by five over the Wolfpack. And so here we are as we get set to get this third game underway this weekend. And it'll be an intriguing matchup between these two schools. NC State did a real nice job once Florida State jumped out to a big lead. Credit the freshman Brooklyn Lucero, who we weren't even sure we would see this weekend for throwing three scoreless innings in relief. Seeing the most work of any NC State pitcher in game two. And speaking of pitching for Florida State, it'll be Danielle Watson, the transfer from Louisville, getting the call for Lonnie Alameda here in game number three. Yeah, Danielle Watson actually came in at the bottom of the seventh last night to shut the game down through, I think, three pitches, something like that. Beautiful pitches. Got the outs, got out of the inning, and we're seeing her start in this third game of the series. Danielle throws in the mid to upper 60s. Sometimes she'll hit that 70 mark. She likes to work a rise, a fastball that she'll spot, and she will come down in the zone. The key for her is that changeup. The changeup has been a newer pitch that's been in development this season. If she can throw that pitch consistently and throw it for a strike, that's what really helps set her other pitches up. So we'll see how the ninth start of the season for Danielle Watson transpires as she squares off with an NC State offense that has been knocking at the door but has been frustrated to try to scratch them across the run column. One run in each of the first two games for an offense that has been one of the most prolific in the conference this season. And as we take a look, at this batting order for the Wolfpack. It once again will be led off by Sam Russ, who reassumed the leadoff role earlier this afternoon. It, she had moved down the lineup into the two spot for a little bit, starting in the Virginia series. Prior to that, had been the leadoff hitter for the Wolfpack 104 consecutive prior games. So now, after a good couple of games, she remains now the leadoff hitter once again for NC State. Good to have you with us as we are underway in Tallahassee. An early look at Danielle Watson's rise ball to Sam Russ. And Russ is followed up by Forbes, Farragher, Rizzi, Morris, Visser, Sack. Keep an eye on Carson Shaner, who came in to pinch hit and recorded a very loud line out to the first baseman, Lizzie Mason, and then the very next time she came to the plate, singled through the right side. She's followed up by Haley Hazlip at the bottom of the order for Jennifer Patrick Swift, but we've seen this weekend that Hazlip starts off defensively at first and then usually is substituted once her, not, once her time is called to come to the plate. One one the count, make it one two. Redshirt junior out of Charlotte, North Carolina. All ACC second teamer and all tournament team member back in 2019, the last full season of softball. And the ACC player of the week back on March 9th. That ball is hard hit and down the line. Russ is going to lead this game off with extra bases. She is turning for three to get this game started. And if 
you've been following NC State and watching this series, you know that Sam Russ has wheels. And so that's a hard pitch right here. Danielle Watson coming in on Russ. I think leaves a little bit too sweet over the zone. Russ does a good job turning on it, and that's an undefendable spot that Russ was able to put it with her wheels definitely going three. Ooh, a leadoff triple for Sam Russ down the right field line. And on six pitches, NC State has a chance to strike first. It'll be Tati Forbes, full name Tatiana. Teammates, coaches call her Tati. Senior from Redmond, Washington. Truly a gifted hitter. Came into this set recording hits in 27 of 33 games as that ball will drop and that will play Sam Russ immediately. NC State is on the board first. Very similar position for NC State as the previous game, game two. They came out, they were attacking in that first inning. They actually scored in the first inning in game two. No different here. They're coming out. They're going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Florida State. Farragher off the end of the bat. Muffley does a good job to get on top of it and keep it from getting into the outfield. But Farragher is safe at first. Multiple runners now aboard. Josie Muffley just needs a little bit of a breather. She has made so many incredible plays over there at shortstop, whether it's been diving stops, whether or you know just making the catch at second base. Look, she was actually going in the opposite direction, I think, to cover second base because they thought that there was going to be a steal there by Forbes, and so she had to make a quick change of direction to get that to get that ball, stop it going from the stop it from going into the outfield. Go an infield single, for Randy Farricker. That is now three hits to start for NC State. Rizzi will lay down the bunt to move the runners. Mason couldn't hang on to it, and now the bases are juiced. Lonnie Alameda is making a trip out from the dugout already. Just 10 pitches into game number three. We talked about even closing out the last game, the previous game, talked about not to count NC State out. They're going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Florida State, and they have done that already in this start of this first inning. They're setting a tone. They're putting pressure on. They're just situational hitting. We talked about their home run power. We're here. They're just putting the ball in play, playing some small ball, making Florida State's defense work. It almost looks like Florida State may be a little bit on their heels right now. So Coach Alameda in her 13th season has made plenty of those trips before, trying to find the right formula, trying to come away with the right message, and certainly she's done that successfully time and time again. We'll see how this trip works out. Bases, again, are loaded. It is Forbes on at third, Farragher stationed at second, Rizzi on at first after the error by Elizabeth Mason. State has started this game off with a triple, an RBI base hit, another base hit to short, and then the error. Here's Logan Morris, the junior from Sumter, South Carolina, and the staple of the infield at third. Let's see, Florida State has, there's no outs, so you see the infield defense has collapsed in. They're trying to cut any more runs off at the plate have an opportunity for a force play and possibly an easy double play in any bag. Morris, the RBI leader of the ACC. She added one to her total in game number one, drove in Tati Forbes. NC State's only run in game one of this doubleheader, game two of the weekend set. This ball is lifted out to left field. Davis tracking it underneath it, and the Wolfpack are out ahead 2-0. Bill 
RBI sack fly for Logan Morris. Did her job to extend the lead. And I hope that the younger folks that are watching, if you play softball and you're seeing that, I know sometimes you get a, a sack fly and you, and you kind of get down on yourself because it wasn't a hit in the book for you. That will advance Farragher to third. Take a second here to set the defense for the Seminoles. That fly out to Danny Morgan. She's joined in the outfield by the aforementioned Cassidy Davis and Kaylee Harding up the middle, Muffley and Flaherty out on the corner, Cheryl and Mason behind the plate, Shelna. We've introduced you to Danielle Watson as well. And back to your point, Megan, it might not be the trendiest result at the plate, but again, if that's what gets runs across the board, that's kind of what you're looking for here. It's not even kind of what you're looking for. You're NC State, you scored one in each of the first two games. Now in the first inning of game three, you've scored two combined. Exactly. So, you know, the whole point for me even bringing that up was to say that for you younger athletes out there, having a sack fly and getting a run for your team, that's what it is about. You don't play an individual sport. So saying that Danielle Watson clipped sack there on the full first base, but just to finish that point up, it's okay. Sack flies are good. You score runs for your team, that's what matters. Factors into a category of what Coach Alameda has described in conversations as QPAs, quality plate appearances. And NC State's put together a number of them here in the first inning for the second game in a row. Carson Shaner, the eighth Wolfpack hitter to come to the plate. She comes up empty, that ball gets to the backstop. Watson applies the tag and stops the bleeding. NC State all over Danielle Watson and the Seminoles to get things started. A rise ball got to the backstop, but Watson making a statement of her own here between the Wolfpack and the Seminoles. 2-0 NC State heading to the bottom. Well, Megan, you and I were both incredibly impressed by Abby Trahan last night. Made very few mistakes. You can count them on one hand. The senior from Kaplan, Louisiana, majoring in criminology. Making now her 17th start this season. ERA at 3.65 through 92 combined innings. 92 strikeouts to 30 walks. We'll go ahead and we'll let you set the uh, scouting report on Abby before I go into the point I want to make here. Sure. So what we saw from her last night is she's she throws a little bit slower, meaning uh, she's going to be in that low 60s. She needs to live on the corners to be successful. She throws a lot of off speed. She'll actually have a rise and off speed, and then two different change ups. So that was incredibly effective against Florida State's offense in Friday night's game. And so as she squares off with Lizzie Mason here, Megan. My question to you is this, if you're Abby and you make your way out into the circle and you've watched your offense give you a two run lead, how do you mentally approach that circumstance? Yeah, so that's a really good question because you'll hear different things from different folks. My philosophy has always been, yeah, it takes some pressure off and I like that. That's a good look at one of her off speeds. But at the same time, as a pitcher, I had to approach it as it's 0-0. Zero, zero. I don't care what the score is. I've got to keep that attack mentality, especially with Florida State's offense. I mean, Florida State fans know this. You cannot ever count Florida State out. It's an early strikeout for Trahan, who on four pitches retires Lizzie Mason. And that brings up Sid Sherrill. Off speed floats in. 1 0 count to Sydney. Now, if you recall when we saw Trahan last night, she will mix the change up and that off speed pitch every at-bat multiple times. 
put a charge into that one, but didn't quite catch all of it. It's popped up to center field. Angie Rizzi there to retire Sydney Sherrill. And she's joined in the outfield by Russ and Forbes up the middle of the infield. It's become a pretty darn good tandem of Farragher and Visser out on the corners. Logan Morris and Haley Hazlip with Sam Sack behind the plate. First pitch strike to Kaylee Harding. Just the same batting order for Florida State, minus a deep key switch. It was Emma Wilson who came in to close game two in the circle for Florida State, who actually started game two as the DP today. As we take a look at the lineup, which again is almost identical, save Kaya Lepresti being the DP in game three of this four game set. It was a look that really benefited the Seminoles in game two, but through one inning, they've got a lot of work to do. NC State strikes early and they maintain a two run lead through the first in Tallahassee. And so with that ball getting to the backstop and Farriker racing home trying to tack on a third run and getting thrown out there, Carson Shaner will resume the action at the plate here as we get back to the top of the second. NC State up 2 nothing on number six Florida State here at the Seminole Softball Complex. The Wolfpack trying to scratch off a win here on the road and make a statement to themselves. The conference in the country is Shaner, who's batting nearly 500 when leading off innings this season, will do just that. The junior from Pittsburgh, North Carolina, batting about 150 on the season, one of a large number of hitters for NC State that has recorded any number of home runs. Part of their aggressive mindset, she's first pitch swinging and she pops up to left. So we'll see what the Wolfpack do here at the bottom of the order. It looks like they will stick in this game with Haley Hayslip. Hayslip has been tremendous at first defensively for them this season. She's one of a couple of options that they've platooned there. The freshman hometown kid from Raleigh. Takes a big cut there at the 1-0. That was a nice look at Danielle Watson's rise ball coming up and in. You know, it's interesting for NC State, and I, and I only only bring this up not to jinx anybody or to speak anything into action. I don't believe in that anyway. But it's NC State talks about this home run mentality and what Coach Jennifer Patrick Swift teaches or what they teach. And more typically on that three-game series, but they still use it this year, is they tell their hitters they want one home run a weekend. If they can hit nine home runs in three or four games, they're going to win a lot of games. Plus, it also takes away a lot of pressure that they have, you know, shooting for certain batting averages or going three for four, you know, that kind of thing. So um, even if a hitter goes over on the first or even the first or sec of the second game, they're still confident they can get their job done. Hayslip doesn't have an overwhelming number of plate appearances, only 23 official at-bats. That is her first walk of her D1 career. And Megan, it's also a point that I think is worth revisiting because when you equate just the casual fan, home run mindset and aggressiveness at the plate, you don't necessarily equate that on a casual perspective with leading the country in on-base percentage, being one of the leading walking teams in the conference. And so they really have done a good job of balancing the power potential, have Jennifer Patrick Swift and her staff, with being somewhat selective and making sure you're swinging at the right pitches. Exactly. It's not about a home run mentality. It doesn't mean you just go up there and you swing at any and everything, right? It's You've got to be selective. You've got to see good pitches to be able to make that work for you. And, you know, she says that Coach Patrick Swift says that 
they're swinging for a home run no matter what the count, which is why when you see these full counts, you still see the NC State hitters with big swings. You don't see the typical shorten up, try to put it in play. They don't care what the score is, what inning it is, or what the situation. They have three strikes to try to get the ball out of the park, and that's what these hitters are trying to do. And the only strikeouts that they do not take kindly to are the ones where you're frozen looking. Aggressiveness is the standard at NC State, and it's really an exciting brand of softball that she's promoting in Raleigh. Here's Tatiana Forbes, who singled in the first. Snap throw to first. You know, if you think about that's the mentality that NC State has that they're bringing to the table and how Florida State, yes, NC State is up 2-0 right now, but they have not hit it out of the park. <laughs> Obviously, that's not all you want to do, right, in a game. So NC, Florida State has done a good job keeping the ball in the park. Hitters up and down the order for NC State. Minus Forbes, who is really the lone slapper in the order. Now, if you go back to her earlier stops in her career, Coastal Carolina and FIU, she actually did have a home run or two with the Shanta clears. So just because she's a slapper doesn't necessarily mean she will never hit a home run. You don't necessarily expect it, though. And what she's been able to do, she's been able to pepper basically everywhere on the field and drop balls in for base hits. She's one of the more gifted hitters in the country and is especially so with two outs where she bats above 300. Ground ball here to short, and Muffley chooses to go to second for the force in the final out. Here, top of the second, in Tallahassee with the Wolfpack up 2-0. Welcome back to Tallahassee, and Joanne Graffield, Sean Davison alongside Dr. Megan Matthews Bunning, and great to see folks and pups and cutouts and who only knows what in the stands. I kind of hope they keep some of those next year. I like having the pictures of the dogs. You know, here comes my nerd hat. <laughs> there is research out there that animals, particularly dogs, use as therapy dogs, but even just for anxiety and things like that. They really are effective, and actually there is a baseball team, I want to say it's UNC, had a dugout dog that they would bring into the dugout. They absolutely do. I can't remember the pup's name. I do remember it's a golden retriever. That is not a golden retriever on that particular cutout. <laughs> I've always been an advocate for Bark at the Park. This is a different interpretation of that. This ball's popped up to first, and Hazlip has secured it. Got word in from our terrific control room that his name is Remington, and that reminds me, they call him Remy the Bat Dog. Tip of the cap to our graphics op, Andrew Rothschild. Well, if you ever want to watch a actual bat dog, follow Finn the Bat Dog, F-I-N-N. -N. Okay. I know he's on Twitter, probably has some other accounts, but he is a black lab. He is fantastic. He actually works with baseball teams and will run bats, run water, I mean, it's nuts of what he can do, and it's just fun to watch. It's fun to watch what Anna Shelnut can do, too, at the plate. She pulls that one foul, but she's got so much power. The, the senior from Franklin, Georgia, with one swing of the bat, can change things in a hurry. Did so the entire postseason during Florida State's run to the Women's College World Series. Some folks forget, even before that NCAA tournament run, there was an ACC tournament final against a really good Pittsburgh team that year. And Pittsburgh was on the doorstep of winning the ACC tournament. 
That was until Anna Shelnut stepped up with runners aboard. Put a home run over the left field wall. She goes down swinging here against Trahan, however. See Trahan just working that change up. Now, she threw a lot of change ups to Shellnut in last night's game when we saw her. And you've got to be a little careful when you're throwing that many change ups because you don't want the hitters to kind of sit on that pitch. You know, and say, I'm not going to swing at anything because you're throwing so many change ups. I'm just going to wait for you to throw a change up, and that's what I'm going to hit. And that's kind of where you have to get with Trahan. So we're seeing Trahan mix some of her harder pitches in a little bit more so she can hide and protect her off speed. There is Jennifer Patrick Swift, who is calling the pitches here this weekend. She did so in her first year at NC State. That ball is driven to third. And the play across the diamond in time to retire the speedy Josie Muffley. We'll touch on that story when we come back. The Wolfpack leading to number one. Seven straight Super Regional appearances, just one of the number of staggering accomplishments under Lonnie Alameda and the Seminoles who won the 2018 National Championship, the first ACC team to ever win it all in Oklahoma City. But Megan, look, this is alumni weekend here at Florida State. It's part of the, the homage they're not only playing, paying to their seniors who will soon become alumni, but to all those who have come before and really what Coach Alameda has done a tremendous job of. It's not taking over a program that was per se down on the mats. She took over a program that was incredibly successful year in and year out under Dr. Joanne Graff. And you even go back before Dr. Joanne Graff, uh, Florida State Athletics has been mourning the loss of Dr. Billy Jones, who was really one of the original pioneers and had her hands heavily involved here at the Seminole Softball Complex. Speaking of Dr. Graff, she is in the house as she so often has been over the years. And there you see her storied career. Shepherded this program in from the AIAW in the slow pitch days into fast pitch. Still made a number of trips to the World Series. Won a couple of slow pitch national championships prior to then. And here's some more of the numbers. 21 regionals, seven women's college World Series appearances in a career that spanned from 79 to 2008. So Coach Alameda has picked up from that mantle and taken it even further. Yeah, and she, yeah, I had the opportunity to work with her for three years here at Florida State. And let me just put this out. She started coaching the year I was born. So she's been in the game for a long period of time prior to that. As a coach, one thing that you appreciate is you appreciate when the new coach, the new staff, the new athletes come in and they pay homage to the ones that came before because all of this TV coverage, all of the success that Florida State has had has been built by others that came before. And I think that's incredibly important for programs to remember. Ground out back to Danielle Watson off the bat of Randy Farriker. And that respect and appreciation, we see a lot in different schools. We've seen it directly here at Florida State and the ripple effect of it immediately on our first conference call with Coach Alameda, Sid Cheryl joined us and she mentioned almost to a T exactly what you just said. It's more than just us, it's everybody who came before us, it's every coach who coached before Coacha as they like to call Coach Alameda. And, and she really gets it and it's something that has really been instilled to every player up and down that dugout. And I would also be remiss if I didn't mention here in the city of Tallahassee, and a lot of times it gets overlooked, and unfortunately so, but Veronica Wiggins and what she did at Florida A&M and blazing a trail amongst the HBCUs and making all those trips to the NCAA postseason with Florida A&M had a tremendous relationship with Dr. Graff over the years, and both of them have really done a great job. Constance Orr taking over at Florida A&M, a former UNC standout. 
And it'll be exciting to see what Coach Orr does to move that program forward from its story past under Veronica Wiggins as Rizzi strikes out. Well, listen, Coach Coach Wiggins and Coach Graff back in the day, they worked together. They're in the same city. You know, Florida State and Florida A&M, they have collaborations. And it didn't stop just with the academic programs. It also is with the softball team and I'm sure some other athletic programs that I'm not aware of. And when you're talking about involving and creating a culture that recognizes the past and and highlights the alumni and highlights the previous coaches and those accomplishments, that takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort because sometimes you have alumni pockets that they played under a certain coach and you know when a new coach comes in, they feel isolated or they feel kind of not as much a part of the program when in fact they're very much a part of it. And so Coach Lonnie Alameda has taken it upon herself and her staff to say, you know what, it is a priority for this Florida State team this program, this is how we're going to function. And it's, this is just how it's going to be. The alumni are going to come to games. They're going to come to practices. They're going to come to other events, as is Coach Graff and other coaches. And they're going to be integrated, period. And they do a lot of other functions that, that really highlight that. And you don't see, unfortunately, you don't see a lot of other head coaches that have taken over put the time and effort to do that. And it makes a difference. Also worth mentioning that Florida State also mourning the loss of Dr. Janet Wells, who was also instrumental in women's athletics over the years here as we've got a scary situation. Josie Muffley diving for that ball has yet to get up. like she hit her head. I'm wondering if when she dove for it, if the ball didn't bounce up and hit her in the head or if she didn't just hit her head on the ground. And Megan, you were mentioning for those that weren't able to join us for the first game of this doubleheader, the second game of this four game set, that a lot of times you like that infield to be hard so that it plays bouncier. And so as she dove, if her head did in fact hit that surface, in a lot of cases, there's a purpose for that infield being as hard packed as it is. And so that certainly was not a surface that would have given a centimeter to her. Yeah, I think the ball hit her. It bounced and hit her in the face. Just right on the temple, right where she's rubbing above the eye. The toughness of student athletes across the board, across the sport is remarkable. And it's not often that you see a, a young player come in and play baseball or softball, and their history involves hockey, but that is the case for Josie Muffley. Wow, that ball was lifted high and deep, but foul. And that is the power potential of one April Visser. Doesn't have the biggest or the stockiest frame where you would equate that with just cranking home runs left and right, but she certainly is more than capable as she just illustrated right then if you can hammer that direction. And she has been a quality plate appearance machine this weekend for the Wolfpack. Yeah, and it's not that she's necessarily gotten on base every time, but it's just she's taken the Florida State pitchers deep into counts, made them throw a lot of pitches just by fouling off almost everything that comes their way. And you can see Watson's trying to mix in her change up to try to keep this are off balance. These are flying out to center, back in the first. And that's what she's done a lot of through these first two games and now going on three innings. Two and two to the second baseman. First took off with the pitch, as is so often the case on a full count, and it won't matter as Visser earns another walk. She's earned several this weekend. Number 18, 
And that brings up Sam Sack. Sack, who was hit by a pitch back in the first. Average at 226 on base percentage, a little over 100 points higher. Seven home runs, all of which in a stretch earlier in the season where she was averaging roughly about a hit per game. And there you see why she's hit so many home runs so far this season. Big cut there makes it 0 and 2. to further contextualize, she led the team in slugging, finished second in home runs. So far this season, she's batting 256 with two outs. Chase the rise ball came up with a whole lot of nothing. And so NC State leaves a couple of runners on base. The good news for the Wolfpack is that they do have a two-run lead here in Tallahassee as Danielle Watson finds her form, and that rise ball is good for yet another strikeout. Abby Trahan has been terrific so far through a couple of innings in this game. And that'll make not only head coach Jennifer Patrick Swift smile, but also Chelsea Wilkinson. But for those who were not tuned in yesterday, the point I was trying to make in the last inning was that Jennifer Patrick Swift is calling the pitches here for the first time since her first season in Raleigh because Wilkinson was deemed a close contact through contact tracing with somebody who came down with the coronavirus. And so out of an abundance of caution and to preserve the health of everybody on the field, both sides. Boy, nobody caught that. Trahan laid off, Visser came in, looked like both of them thought the other one was going to field it, and Kyle Presti is stationed at first. Yeah, so let's talk about some defense right here. Usually, if there is a pop-up that is near the pitcher's circle, unless it's directly at the pitcher, so Trahan was going to have to move back. That is a tough play for a pitcher to make. She's having to go backpedal. The pitching rubber is there that can cause her to trip. So you normally let your infielders crash. In that situation, it should have been Visser coming in to make that catch. And if Haslip was closer, she could have come in. But point is, is that you don't want your pitcher making those kinds of catches. It was scored as an infield single for Lepresti. up Devin Flaherty. Flaherty with a couple of hits in the earlier game here today. I guess I'll hurry up on this story. I guess I'm not, some, I'm not meant to get this story in about Wilkinson, but deemed a, a close contact race. We certainly wish her the best. She's been instrumental in the development of these pitchers as that ball is tattooed out to right and off the wall. Runners in scoring position now for Florida State as Devin Flaherty continues what has been a hot showing at the plate all day. Devin Flaherty, this is... Now, Lopresti did what she needed to do to get on base. Doesn't matter what it looked like. And now Flaherty's coming up, creating a spark, just like she did in game two prior to this game. She's the one that got this kind of the momentum going. Now, if you're trying and you're NC State, you've just had a miscommunication, so a defensive miscue, and then you've given up a big hit. So you've got to learn how to stop the bleeding. If, if you mess up, if something happens, doesn't matter what the mess up is, you've got to refocus, get it together, and everybody on defense needs to want the ball, expect the ball, go after the ball, be aggressive. 
don't play on the defensive mindset, play with an offensive mindset. As we head to the very bottom of Florida State's order and Danny Morgan, Kaylee Mudge into pinch run for Kyle Lepresti. This ball will drop. Oh my goodness, Mudge will come in to score. Flaherty slides in safe and we are tied. go started with the miscue on who was going to catch that pop-up gave up a hit and then turned around and had another miscue she lost it in the sun if you're playing in the outfield you have got to be wearing sunglasses a visor something scored officially as a hit And Mason will try to lay down a bunnet rolls foul. And also worth noting on the throw home, Morgan advanced into second, so Florida State maintains a runner in scoring position. Still nobody out. As we now work to the top of the order. bottom half of Florida State's offense has really been setting the table for the top of the lineup. Last, you know, kind of carrying over from game two prior to this game. Mason lasers one to center. Rizzi will double off Morgan. It's a solid hit. Number 24 by Elizabeth Mason, and then you see Danny Morgan didn't even pay attention. I don't know what she was looking at over here, but did not even see where the ball was going. So that was a base running mishap right there. Ended up getting herself picked off. Clear the bases as Sid Sherrill steps into the plate. Ball here, Farriker charging in to make the play and will do so at first. But the miscues prior to that play loom large for the Wolfpack as Florida State was able to score the equalizer. First, it was a pop up that wasn't fielded in the infield. Then Morgan with runners aboard goes down the line. Tatiana Forbes couldn't track it down and two run score for the Seminoles. The plot thickens here in Tallahassee as we head to the top of the fourth at Joanne Graff Field. 87 degrees, feels more like 90. Sunshine State living up to its billing with wind coming out of the north northeast at two miles per hour. Ground ball here off the bat of Shaner and Mason hops on the bag, one down. Haley Hazlett. In game one, it was Haley Lambrecht who stepped into the plate for Hazlett, who in every game has started at least defensively at first. In game two, they went with Libby Whitaker and then eventually brought in Shaner to replace Whitaker. 
And so here in game three, they're sticking with Haley Hazlip. You know, I keep thinking about the weather report that you gave, and you know, we talk about how nice it is, and he just have to talk about, but there's something actually there with the weather, particularly in a place like Tallahassee, because when I mean, you think about it, it feels ni like 90. I know in the Raleigh-Durham area, era, excuse me, area where NC State is, it is not that hot. It's not quite as humid. So think about, you know, Florida State was picked as a possible regional site. So you get the postseason, that's going to be mid-May. Think about what the weather's going to be at that point. I mean, you're looking at solid 90s. That summer humidity is going to come in. I know I played at a Southern school, coached at Southern schools. In postseason, we love to get teams to our facility in the south, even here at Florida State, because of the weather. And we wanted we wanted teams from the west coast because they're not used to this type of weather. So, you know, that's you kind of have to think about how – the weather is where you're going to play. How is that going to affect your athletes and how can you prep them for it? Count 0 and 2 as we head to the top of the order in Russ. And I think the other element to that too, especially bringing in schools from the West Coast, Megan, is there's also that adjustment. Your body clock has to change too based on all the time zone shifts. Absolutely, and they talk about that in baseball quite a bit. I think there's actually some research out there that takes about three days when you're crossing time zone for your body to fully adjust. And so you think about the condensed amount of time that softball has to play in that postseason. Now this year I don't expect to see a lot of coast-to-coast -coast travel right. because of uh, COVID, but still. I'll give you an example. Uh, when I was coaching here, because we had such hot weather here, we would have to go up to, say, Boston College. And if Tiffany McDonald, uh, she's married now, but she's an alumni from Florida State, was a pitcher here, she'll remember this. Boston College was getting snow, so in the bullpens, guess what we did? Uh, you know what? I don't have that much time to guess, so I'm just going to say, I don't know. <laughs> okay. So we would have bullpens, and we would have, I'd have the pitchers put their hands in cold water because it was supposed to be snowy and rainy so that they could learn how to grip the ball when their hands were cold. And sure enough, it worked. Ground ball to Watson. Off her back foot, trying to get that throw into first. And Russ with a lot of speed. I think that's also illustrating the point, Megan. You might not come away with the result you want at the plate, but that's why it's so incredibly important to make a committed run down the line to the bag because you have no idea what's going to happen. Yeah, I, I can't tell you the last time that I've seen a softball athlete not run out a, a pit ball. It doesn't matter where it is, and that's exactly why, because you don't know what happens what's going to happen. Now, Watson knows that Russ has speed, so it looked like she took her eyes off the ball just a little too quickly, and that's something that speed will do, right? It puts pressure on that defense and causes the defender to do things that they feel like they have to rush. When you have speed coming out of the box, you need to be aggressive to the ball, but you've got to still watch it all the way in and then come up and get your quick release. If you don't, you don't have a chance. So keeping with that theme here, as is so often the case at a lot of different schools, a lot of speed at the top of the order. Russ getting that big lead off at first. And Forbes with plenty of speed in her own right. They are a combined, let's see here. I'm going to try to do quick math. Bear with me, folks. There are combined 43 of, looks like 49 on the base pads at the top of the order. Love by Muffley, and again, there's that speed. Forbes got down the line, and Muffley didn't feel like she could get that throw into first in any kind of manner in which it was worth trying to get it in there. Yeah, and it may be something. Now, Florida State, you've seen the fans. They've seen Muffley make plays like that before. So, you know, I don't know if this was just a hesitation on her part. I don't know if maybe when she pulled the ball out of her glove and she didn't have a really good grip. If you saw 
the replay on this, when she's coming in, she's having to make a throw off her back foot and almost across her body. A little bit looked like it was going to be on the run. If she's not sure she's got a good grip on the ball, you don't want to make that throw because then you risk an overthrow or a bad throw over to first. And then what you do is you advance Sam Russ to third and open up some other possibilities to perhaps put across the go-ahead run. Still a sticky situation regardless here for Danielle Watson and the Seminoles. One out to get the multiple runners aboard. Yeah, and that also goes to show, you know, Muffley makes in the pass, or when she does make that throw, she makes that play look really easy, but it's not. Yeah. And, it's, and you're not going to be able to make plays like that all of the time. So, again, this is just me speculating. I don't know if she had the grip or what, or if she just didn't throw it. Doesn't matter. If she didn't feel good about it, it was a good decision to hold. Could not agree more. We've seen it happen time and time again. That's how you compound errors. That's how you move runners that ordinarily wouldn't have moved. And that's how teams can scratch across some of those unearned runs as that ball is lifted out to left and down the line. That is fair. Multiple runners are going to come in here for NC State. Farriker gives the Wolfpack a couple of runs and a much needed shot. out. Randy Farragher coming up big right there for NC State. Two outs. She goes down and gets that change up from Danielle Watson. She has so much power in her upper body, she's able to lift that ball down the left field line. Easy. And if you're tuning in from Raleigh, if you're an NC State alumnus or fan, and this is what you were hoping to see, you've got what you're looking for. Here in the top of the fourth, the Wolfpack, who have been in so many close games this season, trying to come away with a marquee win. That's a strike against Angie Rizzi, the center fielder. But that is one heck of a response. It would have been easy to get in your own head after some of the defensive miscues that allowed Florida State to tie it up. Instead, they get right back to work with their bats and take the lead right back. You know, Coach Patrick Swift, this is what she sees in her team. She, I, I can just imagine her sitting right here, right now, thinking about the, the kind of the losses that they've had, and then sitting here and just kind of smiling, saying, but this is where I want this team to be. I want you to be competing. I want you to come out and battle because eventually it's going to fall. So she's got to feel good about this and the way NC State is performing. Now, Coach Lonnie Alameda for Florida State knew that they were going to have a test this weekend. They were going to have a battle based off of particularly how NC State went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Clemson at, at Clemson. So. She knew coming in that this was going to be a battle. And it's not just to Megan that they battled Clemson so well, and they've been battling Florida State, aside from, of course, game two where it got away from them a little bit so well. It's not just the names of the schools. It's the fact that they're head and tails so far this season, the best two teams in the conference. And they had a very good chance to take the series at Clemson and had some frustrating losses had an opportunity, night one against the Seminoles, didn't get it done then, and now here they are creating yet another opportunity, on the road no less, against the top 10 team at the top of the ACC. She got underneath it just a little bit, but don't let that Solely the proceedings here in the fourth for the Wolfpack. It was still a successful showing at the plate for NC State. They saw their two-run lead evaporate, and Randy Farriker says, no problem, I got you. The Wolfpack played two more, and they lead it 4-2. Back to Tallahassee here on the ACC Network Extra. Sean Davison alongside Dr. Megan Matthews Bunning and our pal, Jim, uh, Jim Garbarino here. There we are. Hi there, everybody. Megan, 
we've talked about the the conference element and how wacky things happen in conference and I don't know that you can call this wacky by any stretch of the imagination NC State has had a penchant of competing and being in close games and so far this time it looks like they're making it count yes yeah, sorry I got distracted by the <laughs> <laughs> Our cameraman that, bless his little heart, has to live in a tent. That's the COVID tent. But, uh, yeah, just to speak to what you're talking about, they are making a comeback. I, I don't know what else to say other than uh, we knew coming into the series, Florida State knew that this was going to be a battle. And I think uh, NC State knew, too. And that is exactly why Haley Hayslip has been getting the starts defensively at first. She has come along very strongly. And when you think about, oh, one inning ago, NC State had a hard time fielding those pop-ups and getting them cleanly into the glove. She had no issue there in foul territory. Davis lifted that ball out into the outfield and Angie Rizzi ranges over to make the play. So far this is exactly what the doctor ordered for Abby Trahan and the Wolfpack defensively. Working quickly here through the first two seminal hitters she's seen. I mean, lost in the fact that with some of the, the misplayed pop-ups and whatnot, look at that pitch count through four innings for Trahan. Three and two-thirds, might I add, but still impressive, no less. That actually is very impressive. And But I think what I'm most impressed about as, uh, excuse me, is, is that she is coming out after Florida State has put some runs on the board. Her team has then come back and put runs on the board, and she is helping to continue that mentality of, listen, we're not going to let this momentum shift. I'm going to come out. I'm going to do my job, keep us in this game. Sometimes you can see pitchers kind of slip on their, on their mindset, and so they kind of relax a little bit, and that gets them into trouble. They start missing over the plate, throwing too many balls, that kind of thing. One-one to Shellnut. This one might drop, but no, it won't. Look at Farriker showing off the wheels into the outfield grass from her position at short. And whether it's at the plate or whether it's defensively, Farriker has come to play today. Florida's capital city of Tallahassee in the Seminole Softball Complex is the location for what is turning into one interesting affair between NC State and the sixth-ranked Seminoles. It's our pal James over there on low third. Abby Trahan has been terrific for the Wolfpack. Really all weekend long, she got the start on Friday. Only made, what, Megan, maybe three mistakes in that entire showing. Left the pitch too sweet over the plate that Mason pummeled over the left field wall. Speaking of well hit, that one was pretty well hit off the bat of Morris, but into the glove of Danny Morgan. Then didn't really take a lot of time to regroup and came in and hit Muffley. And then maybe there was a sequence where she gave up a walk, and that was it on Friday. Florida State scratching across a run in the seventh on some infield singles and all that kind of stuff. But she has been dynamite today, and Watson's really trying to keep pace. The offense got her back into it, and then Farragher went down the line. So we'll see how Watson can respond here. Florida State has really had a hard time adjusting to Trahan and the different speeds that she's mixing. And listen, that's it's tough as a hitter to make the adjustment when you're seeing a different speed on a pitch in a different location at every every pitch that you see. I mean, and I mean that that if you look at Watson, she's throwing hard pitches. She's probably going to throw two or three hard pitches in a row. Yeah, they're going to be in different spots, which is typical. And then she'll mix in a change up here and there. But 
Trahan's throwing an off speed, a, a, a change up, then she'll throw a hard, then she'll throw another off speed that maybe is a little bit faster, a little bit slower than the one before. Then she may throw her uh, other change up. So I mean, it's just, you know what I'm saying? There's just a lot of mixing of speeds. Looks like NC State's playing off the K time chance by saying hit time. And they have done that quite well here in this game. Seven in total. But Visser comes up empty. And so the lead remains two. There's only two out. I was going to wait a second here. Yeah, y'all threw me off. Everybody came off the field. <laughs> I was looking at my scorecard thinking, how in the world did I miss a hitter? <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> so we got to back that back up. I, I mean, everybody Three came off even, the field. Yeah. <laughs> everybody. Just nonchalant. There you go, Dan Morgan. You got two. That's right. Me and you were on the same page. Couldn't quite haul that one in off the bat of Sam Sack. As that player drops in right center. So Danny Morgan was trying her best to get to that pitch. That was a long way for her to go. And she went ahead and she dove there, and that's not a bad decision. There are no runners on base. There are two outs. And she knows that she dives because of the trajectory of the ball, what, the way it's coming down from that pop-up. It's not going to go very far if it gets past her. And so here is Carson Shaner. A ground out in the fourth. This one's popped up, but out of play. And so this time, in amongst the, the K time and the hit time chance, if they do come away with a strikeout or some other inning ending play, that will be out number three. And so it's okay. You can come off the field now as Florida State gets through the top of the fifth. NC State with a two-run lead. ACC Softball Tournament. And if it all ended today, this is what we would be looking at. Louisville, Pittsburgh, Syracuse, North Carolina playing those playing games on the 12th to get into that quadruple header on the 13th. And there are some scintillating matchups. Virginia Tech and Notre Dame, Florida State against either Cuse or North Carolina, Clemson against Louisville or Pittsburgh, and then Duke, NC State, which will be the matchup to close the season for the Wolfpack and the Blue Devils. And then the possibilities on the horizon, regardless of who comes out of some of those matchups. I mean, if you go straight chalk, Megan, I think the more interesting one, or, and it's hard to even classify what's more interesting than the other, but the fact that we haven't seen Clemson and Florida State on the same field yet, I think is a real scintillating matchup, and that would be, regardless of how it shakes out, the one seed versus the two seed, as both have kind of stretched the gap over everybody else. And if you go back to Coach Rittman and Coach Alameda's days at Stanford together, there's a whole bunch of different angles that you could use to approach that matchup that make it incredibly appealing. Yeah, I, for one, am hoping that we do see that matchup. Just as a fan, I think, like you said, it's going to be a lot of, I think it's just going to be a lights out game. Now, some things need to happen. I mean, right now, Clemson's sitting as the regular season ACC champion. So Florida State really needs these wins to get back up there. And what, what kind of hurt Florida State was that random tie at yep. Louisville last weekend, or Louisville, excuse me. And, you know, you don't see that a whole lot in softball. That's more of a soccer thing, right? But 
Unfortunately, it is something that you have to deal with sometimes when you have travel arrangements. Florida State had to catch a flight, and so there's a drop dead time that is set prior to the game. It's set and agreed upon that, listen, we need to drop dead on a game at this point to give the team enough time to get to the airport. And that's what happened with Florida State, so the game ended in a tie. Well, the good news is, and I, and I know I've shouted out NC State's SID Courtney Day a few times. I'll, I'll go ahead and give Brett Klein a, a shout out. He's also the soccer SID here at Florida State. So he's familiar with putting something in a third column in the record book. So at least when it comes down to the official record keeping on the season, you got an SID who knows how to, to work that third column in there. If you can find some silver lining on that random tie. Here is Devin Flaherty. Speaking of silver lining today, her performance at the plate has been remarkable. A couple of hits in game one today, a double a couple of innings ago. And it's been the bottom of this order. And I know, Megan, you've mentioned this a few times. That has really been the spark plug here for Florida State. The bottom part of the lineup, particularly 7, 8, 9, they have been setting the table for the top of the lineup. Devin Flaherty has had a great day at the plate just in appearances. You know, something Coach Long Alameda talks about is it's not necessarily about power, it's about just quality at bats and quality plate appearances, and that's something she thinks the team has gotten better about the last, I don't know, 20, 30 games. So Devin will see a 2-2 here, and we'll work it full. Trahan has yet to issue a single walk in this game. In fact, the home run yesterday came a few innings before she gave up her first walk. And that's a ground ball right back to Abby. And she has no problem putting Devin away and working through the Seminoles in order in the bottom of the fifth. Trahan has been awfully efficient. The 9-1-2 two up. Welcome back to Tallahassee as we head to the top of the sixth at the Seminole Softball Complex. Looks like we're going to have Bridget Nordberg check in here to pinch hit. This is the bottom of the order. Haley Hazlett was penciled in in this spot of the order. And so instead, it's Nordberg, the senior from Pennsylvania, majoring in history at NC State. One and one the count to Bridget. And Nordberg has actually been the DP in the previous game, so it's not like she hasn't seen pitching and is coming off. I mean, she's a little cold maybe for this this game because she's not been starting in this game, but she's been in the game prior to this one. That's a strikeout for Watson. Pitch in the outside corner there by Danielle Watson. Sam Russ has been terrific this weekend. Two for three here in this game alone. 
Rise ball above the zone here, makes it two and O oh as Watson now crosses the 100 pitch mark up to 102. Pitch, outer third, got the corner. Sam Russ, over her career, has been terrific for the Wolfpack. Her career batting average is, at least coming into this series, at 318. That's the fifth highest all-time in program history. Also has the third highest on base percentage in program history. Top 10 in walks. If you were with us on Friday, you saw her record her 100th stolen base. But that one's popped up. Might get out of play. And Shelna just runs out of room. I think Shelna looks a little frustrated, but honestly, I mean, the ball had already touched the net, it looked like. Once the ball touches the net, it's dead. There's nothing she can do. Russ also on a season high hitting streak up to nine. And that ball is hit well, and that will drop in left. How about that? Have yourself a day, Sam Russ. Sam Russ has been a bright stop. stop. Excuse me. She's got game two, close. game three. <laughs> yes. Where am I? Who am I? Who are you? <laughs> Sam Russ has uh, definitely been a bright spot for NC State the last several games. And off she goes, looking to add to her 100 career stolen bases. In fact, she does. So move Russ into scoring position for Tati Forbes. And just like Russ, has had a really nice showing here in this game. Top of the lineup for NC State has been retooled today and in this particular game has been awfully effective. They are a combined seven for 10. And Forbes herself is two for three with the single, most recently coming in the fourth. And I think that's exactly why you're seeing Coach Lonnie Alavita call timeout, pull her defense in, talk to Danielle Watson, talk to the defense. What's going to be the approach here? What do they need to do? With as much as Florida State has struggled with Tryon, you don't want to give up any more runs this late in the game. So Tati Forbes will see if she can deliver despite being behind the count 0-2. She's been able to deliver time and time again today and this season and throughout her career regardless of where she has played. She's 4-0-4 with runners in scoring position this season. And she's one of only four players who actively in the country have 300 or more hits. She had 304 coming into this weekend. Has added a couple more here in this game alone. Yeah, that's crazy if you think about that. I mean, just stop and think about that. She has hit the ball 300 and something times. That's incredible. And she'll see another one. She'll be in the Olympics on the Mexican national team. And I want to circle back to that 
300 hit club. She joins Sammy Williams at Iowa State, Amber Bishop at Liberty, and Sis Bates at Washington as the only players to record 300 or more hits on the season. She comes up empty there, however, and that's a big second out for Danielle Watson. Nice pitching there by Watson. She was already ahead in the count, then Coach Lonnie Alameda called timeout, so I'm not sure, obviously, I'm not sure what that was said, but whatever was said, Danielle followed through on it, threw some good pitches right there. Line drive snagged at second by Flaherty to retire the side. No more damage done by the Wolfpack, but they have done plenty today. Florida State will try to respond when we come back. Florida State down to six outs, trying to find a way to come back on NC State. If you're just joining us, welcome to Tallahassee. Sean Davison alongside Dr. Megan Matthews Bunning. NC State trying to come away with their first win in Tallahassee since the 2013 ACC Tournament champion, the Championship where Emily Wyman outdueled Lacey Waldrop in the circle. The Wolfpack would go on to a regional. Florida State would go to Mobile for a regional would, in epic fashion with a grand slam against the Jaguars. Eventually make their way to Austin for a super regional. The very next year, the Seminoles would go to OKC. 2015, actually, both teams went to a super regional. And then, of course, the rest is history for Florida State. Repeat trips to OKC, a national championship. NC State trying to rediscover some of that success not all that long ago when you think of it. And with that home run mindset, with quality pitching, what they have gotten from the likes of Abby Trahan and the youngster, really, Brooklyn Lucero today, trying to piece things together and maybe make a stretch run here at the end of conference play, into the tournament, and maybe even an NCAA tournament bid. I think Florida State will definitely make a run in the postseason. And we've talked a little bit here and there about over the course of the last two games about how Florida State is just a different team than what you would see in the past, which should be expected. I mean, teams change, the dynamic changes throughout the years. Then you had COVID and, you know, that kind of stuff. So the team kind of personality is going to change. And Coach Lonnie Alameda knows that. She's acknowledged that, and she's trying to get these athletes to buy into this is who we are this season. This is what we do well, and we need to capitalize on this, this, that, and the other. So we may not be a team that's going to hit it out of the park every time we get up to bat, but we're going to be a team that runs bases well. We're going to be a team that has gotten a lot better at situational hitting, which is so clutch. I see a lot of teams that even get to postseason that do not know how to like, consistently hit in situations. And they're just going to kind of scrap things together. You have to be OK with that. The home runs have been hard to come by for either side, but Lizzie Mason does have one this weekend. That came on Friday. She lined into a double play in the third. To go back to the earlier game today, she recorded a double in the fourth. Has made some nice plays defensively as well. She looks at a 1-1 here from Trahan, who really hasn't given up much of anything here in game three. Off the end of the bat, and she's got the speed down the line. Hazel did her best to make her way and get to the back first, but couldn't quite track it down. And, and we were talking about this earlier, Megan. Rarely, if ever, do you see softball players not run through that bag at first base, and that committed run is what allowed Florida State to have a one-out base run. Yeah, and that actually, I think, was a defensive mis miscue right there by NC State. Hazlip was, was shaded over to the left, 
and then you saw Vi uh, Visser right there, and you could see the look on Visser's face. That was a ball that she wanted to get, and she could have, because it, you saw what happened. It left first base open, and there was no mo movement by Trihan to cover first. So here's Sydney Sherrill. It's one of those off-speed pitches, throw to second. Got away just a little bit from Farriker, but a nice job of covering it by Rizzi, who came charging in from center field, and that holds Mason, who had thoughts for a second of trying to get to third. And that was a good decision not to go. She had a, a great read on that pitch. I'm sure she had a signal, maybe, maybe not, but it was a change up by Trihan that was down in the dirt. You can see Mason sees it's down in the dirt. And she just goes ahead. I think that was her call. Good heads up base running. She kind of hesitated on the pop up there. She didn't really pop up. She kind of got up and I think that took time away, but I think the ball was too close for her to try to advance. Couldn't agree more. Meanwhile, the count one and two to Sydney Sherrill. He continues to battle away here against Trahan, who now, through five and a third innings, has just hit 50 pitches in this game. I know as a pitcher that has to make you smile. Oh, absolutely, and, and we're hearing that's half, literally, than what Daniel Watson's throwing 114 pitches, so you can see the difference in efficiency. Well, the ground out to Visser there moves Mason over to third. Florida State's going to try to see if they can't scratch at least one across here and cut into the lead a little bit. And that'll bring up Kaylee Harding. Nine hits for NC State in this game to four for the Seminoles. Lizzie Mason going down the line was ruled a base hit. And this one's popped up. Rizzi has the glove underneath it. And Florida State will be down to their final three outs. Before we get there, though, the Wolfpack in the middle of their order will try to add to their lead. A two-run lead for Jennifer Patrick Swift's NC State Wolfpack. And it's all smiles over there in that dugout. They're playing the kind of softball they knew they were capable of. And while nothing has left the yard yet, they're trying to win for the first time in Tallahassee since the 2013 ACC Tournament Championship. A 1-0 win for the Wolfpack to win the last tournament before Florida State went on a run. And speaking of runs, there is the first home run. It's off the bat of Angie Rizzi. Well, we talked about how Coach Patrick Swift wanted one home run a weekend, and there it is. So if that's their goal, they've met that goal. First one we've seen all weekend from NC State. Some added insurance by the center fielder. See, the pitch was on the outside part of the plate. Rizzi just did a nice job of getting your barrel out there. Didn't try to pull it, just went with. Barrel to the ball. Five to NC State. As Logan Morris steps in. This batting lineup was completely retooled today. And it's taken a couple of games, but from the outset, the first inning of game one, 
they were starting to put together some hits and now runs. And in this game, they have just exploded all over Danielle Watson and the Seminoles defense. 10 hits, the last a home run by Rizzi to make it 5-2 here, top of the seventh. When I think Danielle Watson is kind of, I, I, it seems to me just from my observations that she's kind of pitching today like she did a little bit earlier in the season. So good comeback right there after a home run. Love to see that. Give up a big home run and then come right back and get the strikeout. So that's different than what we were seeing earlier in the season. But what I was getting at is she's throwing a, a lot more balls and the changeup isn't working consistently for her. We saw her several series ago, and she was in and around the zone. She was really attacking the plate, wasn't throwing as many balls in between pitches. Changeup was on point. I'm just not seeing that from her today, so I think she struggled just a little bit out there. It is now April Visser. Who takes a strike here from Danielle Watson. Pitch count approaching 125. Struck out in the fifth. Did Visser did also walk in the third. Big cut there, it's two and two. Coming into this series, seven of Visser's 14 hits on the season came in the previous 10 games. That's her second strikeout here in this game, however. Another big strikeout for Danielle Watson, so again, Home run, you're not happy about that, but instead of letting that turn, let it, letting it multiply, she's come back with two big strikeouts, like that fight. That is nine strikeouts for Danielle Watson in this game. Charging in to make the play in left is Kaylee Mudge. But NC State adds some insurance off the bat of Angie Rizzi. Their home run mindset, a lot's been said and made of it. And this time, Rizzi delivers the Wolfpack looking for their third ranked win of the season. And the Seminoles are down to the final three outs when we come back. In case you're just joining us, the sixth-ranked Seminoles need a rally at home at the Seminoles softball complex. NC State and their home run mindset have a 5-2 lead as we head to the bottom of the seventh. And certainly, the biggest part of all of it has been Abby Trahan all weekend. She's been terrific. She's been in the circle for NC State's two prior ranked wins this season. They've come against Virginia Tech and LSU. 74 fewer pitches than Danielle Watson to get to this point as she starts off the seventh inning. And this could, without a doubt, be the best single performance by an NC State pitcher in a regular season game in program history. It's hard to go up against Wyman doing what she did, shutting out the Seminoles in an ACC tournament final. But in terms of regular season matchups, this is only paralleled or perhaps even surpassed by a regular season win back in 2007. NC State knocked off number two Arizona State in a neutral site tournament in Fullerton, California. It went eight innings. They won it six to four. NC State used Abby Sims. But in that game, she threw 153 pitches. Trahan has thrown 56. 
Traheim has had an incredible outing so far. But listen, this is the seventh inning. Florida State is known for coming back in the seventh inning, and it doesn't matter how many outs there are. They will do it with two outs. So if you're NC State, you know that. You cannot let up. Trahan doesn't need to change her game. She needs to make sure that she's staying calm, not let the adrenaline get to her, keep throwing her game. Sometimes that can be tough to do when you're heading into that last inning. Cassidy Davis just held off enough to see another. This is the middle part of Florida State's order. She tried to hold up once more, and she's called out at home. One down. See, Trahan's going back to that deadly off speed. Definitely broke the over the plate on that one. Had to get help from you, one to confirm. And so now it's Anna Shelma. Didn't take all that kindly to the postseason Anna nickname. Said she wanted to be called all season Anna. Ooh, I like that thinking. Love that she kind of fired back on that. She doesn't want to be known just for producing in postseason. She wants to be consistent and known for that throughout the entire season. That's a that's a great way to look at things. She stares at a 1-1 here. Bouncer to short, Farriker makes a quality throw to first. Nice stretch by Hayslip as well. And the Seminoles are down to their final out. Now difference last night. The Seminoles had two outs, bottom of the seventh as there were runners on base. There was a runner over there at third. Tie ball game, so a little bit more of a hole here. It is Josie Muffley who will step into the plate now. And she takes a cold strike. The Swifts have climbed the ladder of coaching into this D1 role. Everything has been hard earned and they have tried to rebuild this program and take it up into the upper echelon of the ACC. And as the conference has expanded and the strength of schedule has gotten all the more tougher, it has been a massive undertaking. They're not even in a full third season yet. Year two was abbreviated. And so when you factor in all of that, the way they've gone toe to toe with everybody, regardless of ranking, regardless of location, regardless of the on-paper expectation, it's been all the more impressive what they've been able to do. And certainly there have been some tight games where they would have hoped they would have come out on the other side. We mentioned it coming into today. 13 of, then 18 of their losses, now 13 of 19, had been by a margin of two or less. They've been in these situations before. And this one's popped back on the netting. And so to capitalize on the road against a top 10 team that has for years since you last beat them before any of these players were potentially even recruited by NC State. That's how long Florida State's been running this conference. And to go into Tallahassee when you need some wins, when you need to really build the rest of that resume at the end of the year, and to perhaps do this, what a moment it could be for the Wolfpack. And it shows that on any given day, in any given stadium, 
anyone can win. Here's the one, two. See, Muffley is putting up a fight down to her last strike, and she's just getting in there, trying to put the bat on the ball just to stay alive. Seventh pitch of this at bat. And the 70th pitch coming for Trahan. Abby Trahan is a two-time and in two-conference Pitcher of the Year in the NEC with St. Francis of PA. And then when the Swifts made their way to Raleigh, she went to Southern Miss for a year and was the Conference USA Pitcher of the Year. She was also the Rookie of the Year in the NEC as a freshman. She's trying to come away with a huge win. And she might just have it to first for the upset. NNC State with their home run mindset has a massive win at number six, Florida State in game three of this four game set. NNC State definitely came to play. They didn't let the loss, the upset for them in the first game today, that second game in the series, they didn't let that carry over into the third game. That's exactly what you're looking for from a team. For Florida State, they really start, struggled with Trahan. I would expect to see Trahan back in the circle tomorrow, see if NC State can even out the series. Well, the Wolfpack have come to play and they will have a chance to equal the series tomorrow afternoon. An onslaught of Wolfpack bats from the drop. A leadoff triple got us started. The top of the order was terrific. And do not forget the effort from Trahan in the circle. NC State, thanks to this big fly from Angie Rizzi, added some insurance to make it 5-2. A huge win for the Wolfpack. We'll see you tomorrow.